Chapter Twenty Two of The Child of the Moat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Sherrock. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter Twenty Two To the Rescue. That evening, Elspeth went down to the Arnsides. She was really very much concerned at the line that things were taking, and, staunch Catholic as she was, she had no mind to have her little mistress ill-used. She, of course, knew nothing about her neighbor's faith, and simply went to them because of their interest in Aileen, and she told them the whole story from the time of the coming of Father Martin. "'We've helped her with the linen,' she said, "'but I fear this is a more difficult matter. But it makes my heart bleed for the poor innocent, and she's only twelve years old. We can manage to feed her.' but the child will pine away shut up there. I cannot think what to do. The thing would be to get Mistress Audrey back, said Janet. That would be something. Aye, that would it, Elspeth assented. They talked it over for some time, and Elspeth decided that she would try and say something in an indirect way to Master Mowbray, which might result in his sending for his daughter. When she was gone, John turned to his mother. Mother, somehow I believe Walter Margrave is the man to help us, and he told us to let him hear how things went, and they have gone a deal worse than any of us could have dreamed. He knows the world, and he knows, too, what the real risk is. Even if Mistress Audrey comes back, methinks that will not alter the true danger. Aye, said his mother, but Master Walter was here but yesterday. How are we to get him? John thought for a time, and then said, I have no regular work here, and Silas, who sees to my hours, is one of our faith. I would even risk telling him something, although I need not say it is for Mistress Aileen that I want to see Walter. But how would you find Walter, even if you did consult Silas? said his mother. That should not be difficult, said John. He always calls at Carlisle on his rounds, and I think I heard him say that he expected to be there this time within a senight. In any case, however, he gets there long enough before he gets here. He generally stays with one Timothy Fenwick at the sign of the Golden Keys. How will you go? said his mother. Round by Middleton? No, it is such a long way round. I shall keep this side the river. What? With all this snow? Yes, if I can get off today. The sky is clear, and the weather set, and the snow hard. Well, good-bye, my boy. God bless you, and I trust the Lord will grant you success. John Arnside obtained the permission with no trouble at all, made himself up a bundle, put it on a stick over his shoulder, kissed his mother, and set off. Fortune favoured him, and on the third day he was in Carlisle without mishap. He inquired for the golden keys and easily found the house, but Walter was not there. He found, however, a man seated by the fire. He was of medium height, lightly built, and well proportioned. He looked very ill and was holding one knee with his hands as he leaned back and was gazing into the fire with his deep-set eyes. "'Come and sit by the fire, lad. The day is cold.' John came as invited. I heard you were asking for Walter Margrave, said the stranger. He will not be here for some time. I hope your business is not of importance. Well, said the boy, I must just wait, unless you could tell me where he is to be found. That could not I, replied the other. I know he was going to Newcastle, and then up Tyne and down Tees. After that I think he was going to Skipton, and west to Clitheroe, and then north. He should be somewhere on the Tees now, I reckon, perhaps down as far as Rokeby. "'Do you know the tees? said John. The man lifted his grey, deep-set eyes. They had a far-away look in them, as though he did not see the boy before him. They were watching the tees come over the high force and the rainbow that hung in the quivering spray. "'Yes, I know the tees," he said at length. "'I know the tees." "'Do you know the tees? he went on. And it seemed to John that the hollow eyes in the sick man's face looked at him hungrily. "'Maybe you come from those parts yourself.' I do, said John. I was born and bred in Upper Teesdale. What is your name? John Arnside. The man looked at him, and then the sad eyes seemed to brighten a little. John Arnside? Son of Janet Arnside? he asked. Yes, said John, wondering what was coming next. The man got up and closed the door softly. He then came back and held out his hand to the boy. I am so glad to see you, John. I know about you. I heard you asking for Walter Margrave. And, oh, he continued apprehensively, I do hope it is nothing about Mistress Aileen that brings you here. 
Yes, I know quite well who you are, and you may trust me. John's was a simple nature, and not easily suspicious. He just hesitated a moment, and then reflected that if he merely said what was known to everyone, he could not do any harm. Walter Margrave's part in the matter he could keep for the present as a second string to his bow. They say that Mistress Aileen is a heretic, he said, and they are going to burn her. The man clutched at the table to try and prevent himself from falling. The shock was so terrible in his weak condition, but he slipped back and was only saved by the boy catching him as he fell. Oh, God, he exclaimed, not so, not so. He then made a tremendous effort and pulled himself together, but it was enough for John. There was no doubt that this stranger was in some way as interested in Elaine's welfare as himself. We must save her then, said the stranger in a steady voice while within him his thoughts and feelings tossed as in a storm. Mary, though, what are we to do? Let us sit down and think. Now, look you here. It is not easy to think quickly, but we must act quickly. Can you get speech of Mistress Aileen? No, answered John. She is confined to her room, but old Elspeth sees her. Can you write, John? Gramercy, no. Master, you would hardly expect the likes of me to be able to do that. Well, you must get her my letter, somehow, and furthermore, tell me what you yourself are willing to do for Mistress Aileen. I would give my life for her, said John simply. Then, said the other, looking him straight in the face, you must hie you home at once, and I will follow as soon as I can be ready. Keep a sharp lookout for the inquisitors, and, if I do not come before them, you must get speech of her by hook or by crook, and tell her that I, James Mitchell, told you that she must reveal to you our secret and that you must feed her. She will know what that means, and you must do as she bids you. Indeed, if you get there before me, you had better do this in any case. Surely I will. How could I other? Mary, then, hasten, for even now we know not what an hour may bring forth. We must not wait for Walter, though he would have been our best aid. God speed thy feet, John. My heart goes with thee, and I myself shall follow hard after thee. Without more ado, John took his small bundle and started off at once. Ian was nearly beside himself. The shock had brought on the pains in his head, and he put his hands to his throbbing brows and strove to think. His money had all gone. How was he to act? Certainly the first thing was to get the child away somewhere, but how even was that to be done without horses? If only Margrave and his horses had been to hand. But that was a vain wish. Of course she could be concealed in the secret room, but he felt this was too perilous. There was risk enough in feeding him when Aileen and Audrey had been in the house. Suspicion would be roused tenfold if Aileen were simply to disappear. John would certainly be seen, sooner or later, carrying food to the gully. Mortifying as the discovery of old Moll had been, it was a mercy to be forewarned. No, it might do as a very temporary expedient, but no more. Of course, it might be just within the bounds of possibility to get horses from Holwick Hall itself, but failure would mean absolute and irretrievable disaster. No, again, nothing must be left to chance. Suddenly, a thought struck him. There were horses on the estate where Andrew Woolridge worked. Possibly, Andrew might help him, and, if not, the risk was comparatively small. This then decided him. He would set out immediately. But there was one more thing to consider— should he say anything to the boy, Wilfred? It was true, he argued, that the more people that knew, the greater the chance of discovery. But on the other hand, if anything should happen to him, how was Aileen to be saved? After all, there was still Walter Margrave, who would surely attempt to do something. Finally, he went and found Wilfred. Wilfred, he said, I want to ask a favour of thee. That mayest thou well ask, Master Mitchell. Well, I shall not tell thee more than that it concerns a matter of life and death, so that if any inquire of thee, there will be little that thou canst say, however they question thee. But when Walter Margrave cometh, tell him that Mistress Aileen is in great jeopardy, and let him do that which seemeth him best, and may the Lord quicken his steps. What, the little lady of whom they were talking one night, not long sign? Yes, that same. Now be faithful to us, Wilfred. But Master Mitchell... Thou art not going to leave us, said the boy piteously. After all, that thou hast done for us that cannot be. See, prithee let me come with thee, and thou must go. Ian considered for a moment as to whether the boy might be a help or a hindrance, and decided that it would rather complicate matters than otherwise to take him. No, Wilfred, it cannot be, 
he said, but thou mightest, so far as thou art able, go out on the road to Brampton, when thou art not at work, and keep a lookout for me, coming from Alston or Kirkuswald, between the third and the seventh day from now. Indeed, thou mightest do better, I will show thee more. Keep thine eyes and ears open for all the gossip of the city. I know thee well enough to know that thou wouldst not see any one burned alive, and I go to save one from the burning. If thou hearest aught of inquisitors, come as far south along the road as thou mayest. Wilfred bade good-bye, and promised by all that was holy that he would do everything that he could. Ian had decided to take nothing but one small wallet, as less likely to rouse suspicion, and started off. What was his horror before he had gone ten paces from the door to see a group of black-robed figures on horseback approaching the hostelry, and his horror increased to terror when he recognized one of the figures as Father Austin, who had superintended when he himself had been tortured in York. The keen, shrewd face shewed instant recognition in spite of Ian's altered appearance. "'Whither away, Ian Menstry? Come return to the hostelry with us and have a talk with an old friend.' An evil smile of triumph spread over his face, and he added quietly but firmly to his attendants, "'That is the man we have sought these many months. Our lady hath delivered him into our hands.' Ian said nothing, but Wilfred, who was still standing at the door, said, "'That is not Ian Menstry. That is Master James Mitchell.' "'I am pleased to make your acquaintance, Master Mitchell,' said Father Austin sarcastically, bowing from his horse. "'My name is Ian Menstry,' said Ian." "'You have varying names, then, like a jailbird,' replied the Inquisitor with a sneer. "'We shall have two for our burning, Purdy,' he continued to his companion. "'It will make a right merry blaze. What think you, Father Martin?' "'Burning's too good for them. I would give them a taste of something first. As for that young witch up in Holwick, the devil will be sorry to see her in hell before her time. If she had lived to grow up, she would have charmed men's souls to Satan more surely than any siren ever charmed a mariner.' "'If we burn the body, shall we not save the soul?' said Father Austin. "'That doctrine liketh me not. "'No, Father, methinks in these cases we do but hasten the final judgment. "'Have a care, friend, lest these be heresies also. "'I, a heretic? That is a mirthful jest.' "'Then, looking toward Ian, he went on. "'As for this fellow, he seems a sickly creature. "'I reckon by the looks of him that he has not long to live.' but it is good for the souls of the faithful that he should blaze to the glory of God rather than die in his bed. Mary, methinks he is like enough to faint even now. Nothing but Ian Menstry's iron will indeed prevent it. The pains shot through his head like knives, and his back and joints ached as though red-hot with fire, but it was nothing to the anguish of his heart. Yet he felt that his only chance was to keep up somehow. He would have died on the rack some five months ago had it not been for his sheer strength of will. He had done it before, he would do it again. He would defy them yet. Great cold beads of perspiration stood on his forehead, but he held himself erect. Is it Timothy Fenwick's hostelry you seek, gentlemen? There is a touch of defiance, even of scorn, in the lordly ring of his voice. Father Austin knew only too well that clever as he was himself, he was no match for this man who had beaten him once. But he shall not escape me this time, he said to himself and having already alighted, he followed into the hostelry. "'The day is past its prime,' he remarked, "'and we have caught our main game. We have come far, and there is no haste. We will bide here and rest till Wednesday. The little bird at Holwick will not flutter far, I warrant ye.'" It amused Father Austin to have Ian with them at meals to taunt him and to gloat over his own triumph. Ian realized that he would have little chance unless he were well nourished, so he fell in with their scheme and humoured them. At first he would talk brightly to the others, and then, as he was an excellent raconteur and had a pretty wit, he made himself such good company that they could ill spare him. He played with Father Austin, assuming an attitude of deference and fear with an anxious desire to please. But if he wanted to retire to rest, he would lead him into an argument, and when the father was worsted, he would order the guards to take Ian to his room. Again, by extraordinary willpower, he would achieve the almost impossible feat of forcing himself to sleep. It was Aileen's only chance, he argued, and in that way he almost miraculously overcame the raging torments of his mind. By the Wednesday he had even recovered slightly, and felt rather like one going into battle than like a beaten man. He had thought out several plans, but the best one was to try and contrive to cross the ford of the Eden when it was getting dark. For this, some delay was necessary, 
and he even managed to whisper to Wilfred unobserved, while he set the company off into boisterous and uncontrollable laughter, that he should loosen one of the horse's shoes. He reckoned further to be able to do something more in the way of delay by his powers of conversation. Another part of his scheme was to put his captors off the scent, if he should succeed in making his escape, and therefore he took occasion to remark, "'Well, father, and when we set out on our travels, whither are we bound? Is it south we shall be going?' "'Forsooth, man, you do not think we should go north, do you?' "'No, maybe not, but I should like to see Scotland again.' "'Trouble not yourself, we will never see Scotland more, and when next I visit Scotland, the Regent Mary will be glad to hear that her daughter has one heretic the less among her subjects.' "'But what if I should reach Scotland first? said Ian jocularly. "'That might spoil the pleasure of your visit.' "'There's no fear of that,' replied the other. "'Bishop Bonner may think differently from yourself,' Ian rejoined. "'It is not every heretic that even Bonner burns. "'There's many a slip twixt cup and lip, "'and Bonner might send me to Scotland if I promised to stay there. "'I warrant if once I were on that side again, "'there would be little temptation to come over.' "'Come, this is no time for talking. "'We must be off,' said Father Austin. "'All fell out as Ian had planned. "'The shoe was quite loose,' and before they had reached the city gate, Ian said to Father Martin, "'Methinks, Father, your mare will shortly cast her shoe.' So they returned to the hostelry where there was a smithy. Ian then succeeded in getting them all interested in a thrilling narrative just as the mare was ready, and put off the time until it seemed best to stay and have dinner before starting. More stories lengthened the meal, so that it was not till well on in the afternoon of the short winter day that they actually set out. Ian was placed in the middle, surrounded by the guards, with loaded pistols, and his hands were tied, but not very tightly, as they allowed him to hold the reins. Try as he would, he could not help the violent beating of his heart. Could he, one man, unarmed and bound, outwit all these knaves? The vision of little Aileen rose before him. I must fight the very fates, he said to himself. Verily, I must win. His thoughts travelled back to those days, long ago, when as a mere child he had given his heart worship to the beautiful girl who had gone from him but whom he had loved with a passionate devotion ever since. He had said practically nothing to Aileen, but he was sure that he knew whence the strange likeness came, and for the double claim that she had upon him, fate, that had so cruelly treated him long ago, should be made to yield. He felt the strength of his own will like a white fire, and then he trembled for a moment lest he should be fighting against God. O oh Lord, he prayed, thou hast brought me on this road, and thou hast made this lovely child, let her not perish by the machinations of evil men. Take my life, O God. Give me all torture and the terrible burning, but grant her happiness. He felt a sudden influx of power and prayed again a prayer of thankfulness. Yes, he said, I will bend fate to my will and God will smile on my struggle and then I will yield myself to him and he shall toss me into the void or do unto me in my despite whatsoever seemeth him good. It was a long road, and the spirits of the party flagged. It was, moreover, bitterly cold, but Ian had not dared to put on more clothing for fear that it should defeat his plans. There had been a thaw, and he watched anxiously for the river. He had succeeded during the long ride, in very considerably loosening the cord that tied his wrists, and although it was still quite tight round one wrist, and he could not be certain of freeing the other, he was sure that he could slip it sufficiently to get twenty to thirty inches of free play between his hands. He had managed, too, greatly to fray the portion that would be the connecting piece. It was getting dusk when they reached the river, and, owing to the recent heavy weather and thaws, the ford was so high that the water was more than up to the horse's girths. Ian's heart beat more violently than ever. It seemed almost as though it could be heard. Aileen, Aileen, had she no more reliable deliverer than himself? As they crossed, the horses had to pick their way, and they spread out a good deal so that they were almost in a line with Ian in the middle, who managed also to coax his horse a little bit down the stream. He then nerved himself for the supreme effort, and, first jerking his horse back almost onto its haunches, so as to give in the gloom the appearance of the animal having stumbled, he flung himself from its back, shrieking, Help! Help! as he went. As soon as the water closed over him, he struck out and swam under water as far as he possibly could. Unfortunately, the cord did not break as he hoped, and the swimming was exceedingly difficult, but there was sufficient play of the cord to make the feat quite possible, and the swift current helped him not a little. It was perhaps fortunate that nearly all the pistols were discharged at once, before he came to the surface, 
as they were fired at random into the confused water round the horse, which had some difficulty in regaining its footing. When he rose, he immediately took a breath and went under again. Only one man was looking in that direction, and he did not seriously think that the dark spot in the turbid water was really anything, where occasionally a half-hidden boulder would appear above the water. But he took aim, more or less mechanically, or from intuition, and fired, and the bullet actually grazed Ian's shoulder. Before he had appeared again, the little company had turned to the riderless horse, and those who had lances were prodding into the deeps of the river. Again, he swam under water. It was still very shallow, and he bruised himself several times more or less severely on the boulders in the river bed. He did this twice more, and the water grew deeper, and then he ventured to glance back. They were already but dimly visible, and he knew that he himself was out of sight, so he slowly made for the bank with some difficulty across the current. When he reached the bank, they were no longer to be seen, and he was glad to get out of the icy water, but the air was miserably cold, even more trying, as is often the case, than during the frost itself. He was only two miles from Andrew's cottage, which he had once visited, and he wondered whether it would be safe for him to go there at once. After all, the risk was about as great one way as another. Besides, he hoped that they would think he was drowned, and, even if they did not, that they would think he would endeavour to make his way north to Scotland. In any case, it would not take him long to perish from exposure. Of course, he would have to cross his enemy's tracks, and he decided to keep near the water's edge, as at least affording some chance of escape. He soon managed to get rid of the cord that tied his hands, and crept along by the wooded banks looking and listening intently. After a few minutes, he heard voices, and they grew louder. He lay down on the brink and waited a moment. In the still evening, they could be heard quite distinctly. "'Oh, the fellow is drowned right enough,' said one of the voices. "'Yes, curse the knave,' said the other voice, which was that of Father Austin. "'It grieveth me sore. Mother Church hath missed an opportunity for a great lesson. I would even that we had his corpse. It would be something to show.' and at the least I should get the credit for the bringing of the loon to his death. I am greatly afeared lest he may have gotten away to Scotland. Did he not say something to me himself about Scotland, and the slip twixt cup and lip? He is a deep one, as I know my cost. I would that this had happened earlier in the day. It will be quite dark in about half an hour. Beshrew me, how came it that the rogue was not tied? His wrists were tied, father, said the other voice. I noticed that just before we came to the river. Oh, I meant tied to the horse, but who would have thought of such a thing? However, if the wrists were tied, belike it may have been an accident, and the knave must be dead. I trow it was but a dog's chance. Besides, one of those bullets must have hit him. The body must have been swept downstream. Their surmise about the bullet was true enough, as Ian knew to his cost, and the wound was an added pain. It is wonderful what the human frame can stand, he said to himself. I cannot think how I am alive at all. I must win this game somehow, and the next move is mine. He slowly lowered himself into the water. The men had stood still, a little higher up the stream, not twenty yards from where he was. It was a trying test to his nerves, but he hoped he was concealed by the brushwood on the flooded bank. He waited a while, and heard them discuss how a few of the party would try and make search in the direction of Scotland, and the remainder go south. Apparently, they were waiting for some of the others to join them, and the conversation turned to other subjects. Ian was standing on the bottom, but had to work his arms all the time to prevent himself from being carried down by the current. His teeth chattered and his fingers were numb with the pain of the cold. If I stay here any longer, he thought, the cold will finish me. So he struck out, and by the aid of the brushwood, swam within a foot or two of where they were standing. It was an anxious moment, and although the stream was slacker near the bank, it was slow work. But he passed them unobserved although he experienced a tumultuous wave of feeling when the conversation stopped short for an instant, and he feared that they were listening. But at last he judged that it might be safe to creep out, and at first he crawled and then walked quietly, but finally broke into a run, as much for the cold as for any other reason, and, in twenty minutes from the time he started running, he found himself at Andrew's cottage. It was a secluded spot, quite near the river, and about a third of a mile from the hall where Andrew was employed. He crept softly to the window and peeped in. Andrew was there alone, so he knocked at the door. Andrew's astonishment was immense as he opened the door, and still more so when he saw that his visitor was dripping wet. "'Can you let me have some dry clothes, Andrew, and help me to get warm and provide me something for the inner man?' "'That I can, Master Mitchell. 
and Andrew bestirred himself, brought the clothes, and made up a roaring fire and prepared a simple but appetizing supper. When Ian had finished, he stretched out his feet to the cheerful blaze. It was tempting to stay and rest after all his sufferings. The wound in his shoulder was very painful, although Andrew had bandaged it, and the sundry cuts and bruises made him feel very stiff. But there was much to be done and no time to be lost. He talked things over with Andrew, very cautiously, as he was not sure what line he would take. It so happened that the hall was nearly empty. The family and their immediate entourage were south during the winter, and the reeve was away on business with two of the other men. So Andrew's help in getting the horses was not needed after all. Ian led him into all kinds of general gossip about the place, and discovered how many horses were kept and where the stables were, without exciting any suspicion. Andrew offered to come with him to Holwick, but Ian doubted whether it would not make matters more and not less difficult, and Andrew's disappearance would itself be a clue. Luck favoured him. He found that the man who had charge of the horses, while the reeve was away, was a drunken fellow, whose cottage was not far from Andrew's on the way to the hall. Owing to the absence of the reeve, he was having a more dissipated time even than usual. It was his custom to see to the horses the last thing at night, and Ian determined on an attempt to get the better of him. Without explaining his movements to Andrew, he said it was time for him to be going, and he set out into the darkness. There was just enough starlight to find his way, and he soon reached Jock's cottage. The man had not returned, so Ian crouched down behind a tree to wait for him. He was trembling with excitement and apprehension, and was disturbed in spirit about the part of the venture in which he was engaged. He was deliberately setting out to steal the horses, and he felt that it was a sin. He did not try to justify himself, although he had determined that he would make all possible reparations so that the owner of the horses would not suffer. He had written a note to his mother, which he had given to Andrew, just saying that if his adventure should miscarry and Andrew did not hear from him shortly, he was to take it to Stirling and ask for some relatives of his of the name of Menstry, as he had no relatives named Mitchell still alive. In the letter he had said that she was to clear his honour as far as was possible by replacing the horses if death should overtake him. Yet he did not feel that this in the least altered the crime, but he argued to himself that if the crime did not hurt any one, that it was only his own soul that would suffer. For that he was absolutely ready. He would gladly give his life for Aileen. Would he not also gladly give his soul? It was a great shock to his naturally upright nature, and when he had lied to Andrew and told him that he was going to make his way south on foot, and while his blood boiled with shame within him, he yet welcomed the sacrifice. She shall have my honour and my good name. She shall have my soul indeed as well as my life. Fate may crush me in eternal torment at the last or annihilate me altogether, but Aileen must escape these fiends. She must live to be happy. Sweet little child heart, who never did any wrong to any one, and whose short life has been so sad, and who yet has only been sunshine in the lives of others, why should she be cheated out of her due? As he wrestled with himself, Jock came stumbling from side to side down the path, babbling incoherently. Ian braced himself for the struggle, and, as the man opened the door and entered the cottage, Ian stole in after him. He was utterly unprepared, and, as Ian leaped upon him from behind, he gave one wild shriek and collapsed. Ian tied his hands and feet with his own cord that he had saved, put the man on the bed, and secured the key of the stable. He had comparatively little difficulty in getting out the two best horses, taking the precaution of tying some sacking over their hoofs so as to lessen the noise. Fortunately, the wind was rising, and a storm of rain was clearly on its way. Before leaving, he fastened a note at the stall head. I require these horses, but will replace them when I reach Scotland. Necessity knows no law. One great in need. He took the horses first in a northerly direction, as though making for Scotland, so that their tracks might throw pursuers off the scent. Then, when he reached the harder road, he followed it only a little way and turned back south. Finally, he struck over the high ground to the west, hoping to get into another district altogether, where any travellers that he might meet would not carry any description to the neighbourhood of Kirkoswald. It meant a considerable detour, and the inquisitors had a long start as well, but he felt so certain that they would rest somewhere for the night that he felt very little alarm. Shortly afterwards the rain came down heavily, and he trusted that this would at least help to obliterate the tracks. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of The Child of the Moat. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Chirac. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter 23. A Duel to the Death. Meanwhile, Aileen had been having a very unhappy time. She was practically confined to her room the whole day long, but she did not come down for the midday meal. Master Mowbray, strong as his Catholic sympathies were, not only resented the interference of the priests in his house, but was concerned at seeing the child look so starved and ill, and therefore he had insisted on this much. It did enable Aileen to get some nourishment, although she only had bread and water for the rest of the time, and it did make a slight break in the day, for she dared not use the secret stair except when everyone was in bed, for fear of anyone coming to her room and finding that she was not there. But the meals were anything but a pleasure. Master Mowbray would look at her sorrowfully, but he scarcely ever said anything, and Mistress Mowbray would make cruel, biting remarks and watch the child wince under them. Her poor little soul grew very sad, and night after night she would cry herself to sleep. If only Ian would come! If only Ian would come! She was some time before she actually grasped that the Inquisitors would take away her life, but one day, when Father Ambrose was at dinner, he had tauntingly asked her whether she had repented of her folly, and then, with a leer, had rubbed his hands and said, "'You obstinate minx! They're coming for you right soon! And, ah, how glad I shall be to see your long hair shrivel up and your pretty face swell and burst in the fire!' Aileen suddenly realized that he was in earnest and for the moment was petrified with terror. Then she remembered that many children younger than she had been martyrs in the old Roman days, and for the moment there was a revulsion of feeling, and she smiled to think that she was worthy to suffer death in the master's cause. Richard Mowbray had not realized it before either, and was shocked beyond measure. He said nothing to his wife, but decided to set off at once for York to see the archbishop, whom he knew personally and discover what could be done. He was on the point of forbidding Father Ambrose entry to the house, but he restrained himself, as that would excite suspicion. He was accustomed to going away suddenly for a few days at a time, so that his departure that very afternoon surprised no one. He reckoned that it would take him at least a week and told his wife not to expect him before that time. When Aileen reached her room, her feelings swung the other way again. Why should she die? What had she done? She was sure that God would not wish her to die. She waited till night and crept down to the secret room. She did not often do this even at night, as although there was a good store of candles, she saw no prospect whatever of replenishing it and was afraid of using it up. She sat down on the oak settle and tried to face the situation. If the inquisitors came, she must try somehow to escape, and the incident of the blue hose had suggested that she should do so in the garb of a boy. She rummaged over the clothes that she found and set to work to put them in order and adapt them for her own use. She chose the strongest things that she could find, and during the next few nights she managed with a little alteration to fit herself out with a boy's doublet, coat hardy, surcoat, and a pair of trunks. She found an admirable mantle of russet cloth that only required shortening, and she herself possessed a pair of strong, sad-coloured hose. She reckoned that it would not be possible to cut her hair before her escape, so she prepared three hats, one that was very large, into which her hair could be put in a hurry, a medium one into which it could be put very tightly twisted, and a smaller one that she could wear with her hair cut short to the ears. She also began to lay in a store of provisions, saving all that she could from her slender allowance, as she judged that it would be safest to spend a week, if possible, in the secret room until the first hue and cry had subsided, if she should have to make the desperate attempt to escape alone. But, poor child, her plan was frustrated. It was very cold in her little chamber, so she had been wearing some extra clothing. She decided, therefore, that the wisest course would be to dress exactly like a boy and wear what was necessary of her own clothes on the top. So she put on the boy's shirt and trunks and stitched points to her hose and tied them to those on the trunks. Over this she put a coat hardy and then a belt with a dagger. Above this again she wore a girl's longer coat hardy and above that again a short surcoat. The medium-sized hat was made of silk and the finest kersey, and was therefore easily concealed under her clothes. It had a full silk crown and a brim turned up all round, nearly to the crown itself, with slits every three inches, giving it a sort of battlemented appearance 
with the crown just appearing over the top. Old fashions still lingered in the north, and Ian had had one like it, which he said resembled one worn by Prince Arthur of Wales. She was helped by a little drawing which Ian had made for her when they were talking about the well-known portrait. When she had done, she felt very proud of her handiwork, and the long mirror was a welcome joy at the end of the doleful days. She looked out a sword for herself and practiced making passes. All was ready four days after Richard Mowbray's departure, and three days later, when he had not yet returned, there was a sudden stir and noise in the outer courtyard while they were having the midday meal. "'That will be Walter Margrave, I'm thinking,' said Mistress Mowbray. "'They always seem to make that man's arrival an excuse for neglecting their work. Idle hussies and varlets, all of them!' She rose as she spoke and went out into the screens. Aileen followed her. A tall priest had already crossed the threshold. "'May I speak with Master Mowbray?' he asked. "'Master Mowbray is away. You must ask what you want of me. Come this way.' she said, and stepped out the door at the other end of the screens, so as to be away from the servants and Aileen. "'We have come,' said Father Austin, for it was he, "'with a warrant for the arrest of a heretic, a certain Aileen Gillespie. See, here are the seals thereon of Queen Mary and Bishop Bonner himself. It is well that one be careful in these matters,' he said, smiling grimly. "'Some would be content with lesser signatures and seals, but then their work might be overset.' They had been strolling toward the end of the quadrangle, and were nearing the entrance to the stair that led to Aileen's room. It had only taken an instant for it to flash through Aileen's mind that the hour had come and it was now or never. She followed quietly behind them, and hoped to be able to slip up the stair before they could catch her, and was ready to make a dash as they turned. They turned just before reaching the door, and Aileen made a rush. "'Not so fast, my child,' said the priest, stretching out a long, interposing arm. "'Wither away?' I may want speech of thee shortly. He turned with a look of sanctimonious triumph to Mistress Mowbray. Mother Church will clean your house of this vermin for you, madam, he said. Aileen gave one little gasp of mortal terror and then stood dumb for a second like a small bird caught by a beast of prey. She gave one appealing look toward Mistress Mowbray and then swung round facing the dining hall and paused a moment, with Father Austin's hand still on her shoulder. I prefer to clear my own house, Mistress Mowbray said icily. She disliked the man. She disliked his interference. He could not have said anything more foolish. Aileen's interference had been outrageous, but it was nothing to this. At least the child was one of themselves. Mistress Mowbray's wrath raged at the insolence of this outsider. She looked again at Aileen, delicate, fragile, ethereal, and the thought of the appealing look of the beautiful child at last thawed her hard heart. What if ever Audrey should be in a like plight, she mused. All this was in a flash as she turned to Aileen and, looking her full in the face, said, Audrey, dear, run and tell Silas that there's a rat catcher or something who thinks that we have vermin in the house and would like a job. You can also find Aileen and tell her that he seems to like catching little girls. Father Austin dropped his arm at the name of Audrey, and Aileen, though puzzled, ran off swiftly. As Mistress Mowbray finished her sentence, he bit his lip. He saw that he had made a mistake. "'Who is Audrey, madam?' "'Audrey is my daughter,' answered Mistress Mowbray, with her chin very much in the air. "'I thought that child there was Aileen Gillespie,' said the priest. "'So it was,' said the lady calmly. "'But you called her Audrey, madam,' he replied, and told her to speak to Aileen. "'Did I?' she said, with well-feigned surprise. "'You confuse me with your peculiar language.' Meanwhile, Aileen ran back to the screens, intending to go through and cross the lower court and slip out over the drawbridge. She might reach the stream and make her way up to the cave before anyone clearly grasped what was happening. But when she came to the further door, she was met by a large crowd that had followed the Inquisitors, and it was useless to try and make headway against it. Besides, she saw Father Martin's head appearing over the rest away in the background. She turned back again with the head of the crowd and half mechanically picked up a staff that was standing in the corner by the door as she passed into the court. She pushed her way past two men who were armed with swords and were just stepping through the doorway. She might still be able to get into the library, and desperate as the chance was, she hoped to throw them off the scent by breaking a window before going down through the kist to the secret room. Father Austin was standing near the bottom of the stair of her chamber. That way was closed, so she ran towards the small flight of steps leading to the little terrace in front of the library. "'Seize her, Hubert!' shouted the priest. The big burly man, addressed, rushed after her. 
Aileen swung round suddenly and hit him unexpectedly with her staff on the side of his head and darted on. The man gave a great yell and the crowd roared with laughter, which doubled his rage, and, drawing his sword, he dashed again in pursuit. Aileen was fleet and reached the library door before he was halfway across the quadrangle. She feverishly grasped the handle. Alas, it was locked. As she turned back, Hubert nearly reached the bottom of the steps. Four more paces and his sword would be through her. The heavy man took a great stride halfway up the stair. The hunted child stood at bay. How frail and slight she seemed. Only a delicate flower, ineffectively beautiful. The crowd stood motionless and held their breath while some closed their eyes. Hubert laughed at the absurd sight of the child bearing his way. She could no longer hit him unawares. He was armed and ready. He expected nothing. When Aileen, quick as lightning, by a dexterous turn of her staff, twisted the sword out of his hand and, lunging forward, caught him under the chin with her full force so that the big man overbalanced and fell backward down the steps, stunned. Aileen stooped and picked up the sword. Hubert's fellow, however, was close behind. "'Kill her!' shouted Father Martin. "'Slay the witch, Gilbert!' echoed Father Austin. As she picked up Hubert's sword, she had to draw back in rising, and Gilbert was already up the steps. He was a more active man than the other, but he had taken in the situation and was no fool. So, child as she was, he advanced more cautiously. Poor little Aileen had to think and fight at the same time. What was she to do? Even if she overcame this man, there were others. Obviously, she could not fight them all. But she thought of a faintly possible chance, and, before Gilbert closed with her, gave a glance across the moat. Could she cross it? As she glanced, she saw a sight for which she had been longing all those weary weeks. It was a single horseman with two horses, evidently making his way toward the gully. He was turning to look back at the hall. She saw no more, and straightway began a very pretty bit of swordplay. Gilbert proceeded warily in foin, parry and counterparry followed by a monotonous precision. Aileen kept very cool, and at first attempt little, but after a short time she tried a feint or so in order to test him. She soon found that he was no mean swordsman, but she had learned much from Ian, which he had brought from Italy and France, so Gilbert in his turn discovered that she was not an opponent to be despised. He reckoned, however, that his greater strength must tell in the end, and took things somewhat easily. For a time, therefore, nothing happened, but a little later, after a repost on Aileen's part, Gilbert gave a counter repost and just touched her on the arm. He began to feel his superiority and pressed in harder, while she gradually drew back, a little and a little along the terrace. Gilbert thought that he was slowly mastering her, but Aileen was playing for her own ends, as her one slender hope was to let him wear himself out. The crowd by this time were spellbound, and even the two priests were overcome by the fascination of the scene, the beautiful, agile child and the dexterous but far slower swordsman. The silence was intense, broken only by the clash of the swords. Gradually, they neared the end of the terrace. It was an awful moment for Aileen. The man was obviously getting tired, but she shrank from trying to inflict a severe wound, and he was far too skillful for her to disarm him. There was nothing for it, however, and when almost at the little low wall at the terrace end, the instinctive struggle for life began to tell, and the fighting on both sides became more serious. Aileen received a slight scratch on her left shoulder, and this settled the matter and nerved her to a supreme effort. As he lunged again, she parried, made a riposte with a reprise, following like a lightning flash, and swift as thought her sword was through his heart, and he fell dead on the pavement. The crowd gasped. Aileen stayed not an instant, but leaped upon the low terrace wall. Standing still for a moment, she tore her outer garments from her and stood there like a lovely boy, save for the great flood of hair that had come entirely loose and that was caught on the windy battlement and blown like a cloud high behind her. Then she paused, and turning to the quadrangle thronged with people, she said, "'How dare you play the coward's part!' setting two armed men to attack one small girl. God will punish you, Father Martin, and you too, she said, pointing to Father Austin. And the blood of the slain man will cling to you, and remorse shall tear your hearts. I am only a child, and it is little that I know, 
but I do know that there is no love for a hard heart from God or from men. And you, Elspeth, Janet, and those I love, it is hard to say goodbye, but I must go. Shoot her! Shoot her! shrieked the priest. She blasphemes! She takes the name of God in vain! But the angry crowd surged round the guard and would not let them move. One, however, broke loose and raised his pistol. But as he did so, Aileen, to the utter astonishment of all, still holding the sword, dived into the moat. "'Our Lady shield thee, Saint Aileen!' cried a voice from the crowd. And as the wall was too high to see over, except from the terrace itself, they swept up in a mass, the priests, the people, the guards, and all. A few strokes took her over the water. Ian stooped and seized her under the arms, drew her out of the water, lifted her onto the one horse, vaulted himself onto the other, and they fled like the wind. Shot after shot then rang out, and the bullets whistled only too alarmingly near them, but they were soon out of reach. "'Mount and pursue!' shouted Father Austin, as he stumbled over the body of the dead man. "'And take this clumsy loon and bury him!' "'The horses are tired. We need fresh steeds for that,' said one of the guard. "'Gramercy, take them from the hall!' he roared. But no one would find the keys of the stable, and Mistress Mowbray, coming up a moment later, said in acid tones, "'Take your own horses, Sir Priest. Warrant or no warrant, you cannot steal, and if you touch my horses, I will have you hanged as a common horse thief.' She looked at him triumphantly. The exercise of power delighted her, and she even felt a glow of reflected glory from Aileen's achievement. "'We know how to manage these interlopers,' she thought. "'I am mistress of this situation.' Aileen, you have done very well. Father Austin looked cowed, and the sullen people stood in the way and blocked the road. One managed to secure a stirrup, another broke a girth, while a third removed a halter altogether. You shall suffer for this, said the priests, when they at length reached the horses, but the attitude of the crowd was so menacing that they became afraid for their very lives, and finally had to fall back upon entreaty before they were allowed to go away at all. The result was that the fugitives had two full hours start on good horses before Father Austin could get his little troop under way. Had God sent a deliverer from the skies, mused Mistress Mowbray, as she sat and pondered the strange events of the day. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of the Child this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Sherrock. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter 24 A Ride in Vain. As Aileen and Ian rode over the rough ground, they kept turning back, but nothing was to be seen. They wondered what had delayed the pursuit, but felt sure it would come. The snow had more or less melted and the day was clear, so that they could see far behind them. When, therefore, they reached a place where they could clearly see two miles and no one was following, they slackened pace so as to give their horses every chance. Ian's plan was to swim or ford the swollen river at the wheel, the long pool-like stretch of the Tees, and then take the track to Garrigill. His present anxiety was to keep Aileen warm. He had brought away two big heavy riding cloaks from Andrew, saying that he needed to be warm sleeping on the hills. One of these he put round Aileen, but she was at first very cold. The exercise, however, warmed her a little, and they did not dare to stop until they put the river between them and their pursuers. It was fortunate for them that there was no wind and that the day, although cold, was bright and sunny. The hills looked hard and colourless, but the sunshine seemed to conquer the austerity. They reached the river and negotiated it safely, Ian taking off his boots and lower garments to keep them dry. When they reached the other side, Aileen undressed and put on all of Ian's clothes that he could take off, and they wrung out hers and hung them where they would best dry with the motion through the air. Ian had obtained a sword and two pistols from Andrew, while Aileen had the sword with which she swam the moat. They passed through Garrigal without mishap. Ian was particularly nervous of their being caught just as they reached a village, lest a hue and cry should be raised that would stop them. He looked anxiously back when they neared Alston, but no one was in view. 
it seemed best to make no attempt to keep out of sight by detours, but simply to press on. Their foes, he guessed, would probably get fresh horses in Alston. Oh, if only they had money to do the same! It was impossible to reach Scotland that night, so the best plan seemed to Ian to be to rest the horses at the loneliest part of the road beyond Alston, where they could be concealed themselves, and at the same time get a distant view of the road. After a rest they might make a good run for it, as the day was already getting on, particularly if their pursuers cantered their horses from Alston and came up with them at all blown. Then in the dark the best thing would probably be to abandon the horses and escape on foot. They did as he had planned, and after they had rested an hour and a half, during which time the horses had some oats, Ian saw their adversaries about a mile behind. There were six of them, and they had been badly delayed getting fresh horses in Alston. They were galloping rather wildly down the hill. Ian held his hand for Aline to mount, and then vaulted into his seat, and they set off at a trot. The others saw them, and put spurs to their horses, yelling as they rode. "'Keep cool, not too fast,' said Ian. "'Wait till they come much nearer.' Slowly their pursuers gained upon them, but Aileen and Ian reserved their strength. A mile they rode, and the interval was lessened by a quarter. Their hearts were too full to speak. Another mile, and the distance was again less by a quarter. Aileen looked back. "'Oh, Ian, we shall never get away, and they will catch you, too. I wish you had not come to rescue me. Do you think Mallow the Graves really does know anything about what is going to happen?' "'No, little heart, but do not be afraid. We have been helped so far. I think we shall get away.' Another mile's ride, and they were only separated from their pursuers by a quarter mile. Ian waited. Three hundred yards. Two hundred. One hundred. Fifty. Now, he said, let them go, and both riders lashed their horses, and the distance began to lengthen out again, till it reached three or four hundred yards. Three of their pursuers fell behind altogether. The mounts they had obtained in Alston were not equal to the strain. One was Father Martin, and it would have made Aileen's ears tingle if she had heard the curses heaped upon her and Ian. The other three kept together for a mile, and then they also began to spread out a little. At length there were forty paces between the first and second, and a couple of hundred yards to the third. It soon became clear, however, that though they need not fear the third horse, both the other two would ultimately be a match for them, nor would it get dark soon enough for them to escape. Ian kept absolutely cool, but it was a terrible moment. If he were killed, even if Aileen did escape, who in the wide world would look after her? When the nearest horse was only about sixty yards behind, he said to Aileen, "'Ride on. I think I can deal with these fellows.' But I wish we had more pistols. Two shots will not see us far. Get to Carlisle and find Matthew Musgrave. I doubt not he will smuggle you away over the border. And, if I come not, when Walter Margrave arrives, he will somehow provide for you. But I won't leave you, said Aileen. She looked at him so beseechingly that he knew it was useless to say anything. Then you must do as I tell you. I'm going to stop. You go on thirty or forty paces beyond, and then stop also. Be ready to dismount if necessary. You are a good swordswoman, but you know nothing about shooting. Ian then reined in, turned, and pointed his pistol at the leading horse. The man was taken aback by the sudden move, but fired wildly as he rode and the bullet whizzed past Ian's head. It was only a matter of seconds, but Ian waited to make quite sure and then fired at the horse, which fell and brought its rider with a horrible crash to the ground. The second horse was treated in like manner, but its rider saw what was coming just in time to slacken his pace and leap to the ground as the horse fell. He then fired twice, missing the first time, but grazing Ian's left side with the second shot. He was a big, powerful man, and before Ian had time to step back and mount, he was in upon him with his sword. Ian had time to draw, but found that the man was no fool with his weapon. Time was precious too, for the third horseman, who had drawn rein for a moment, was now advancing and would be upon them immediately. Aileen, who had seen this, dismounted and shouted, "'Leave him to me, and load your pistols!' But before she could reach them, Ian's sword was through the man's neck. Luckily, the horses stood, but he had only time to load one of the pistols while Aileen mounted again before the third man arrived. He slowed up as he approached and attempted to fire from his horse, but the pistol only flashed in the pan and missed fire. Again, Ian brought the horse to the ground, and as the man, who was not seriously hurt, picked himself up, Ian said, "'Well, good-bye, my friend. I'm sorry that urgent business prevents our waiting,' and springing to his saddle, he galloped off. 
Before the man could fire, they were some distance away, and the bullet went hopelessly wide. "'That's twice I've been shot in three days, little one,' said Ian. "'It's a mercy these fellows cannot shoot better.' "'Oh, you never told me about the other,' said Aileen. "'And you must wait now and let me attend to this. "'The blood is all over your arm and down nearly to your knee. "'Indeed, I must not, sweet child. "'We shall soon have the rest of the gang after us. "'In fact, I do not know what to do. "'The horses are completely done, "'and yet it is not safe to put up anywhere. "'Whatever happens, we must not be caught in a town. "'I believe it would have been safer to have waited and killed them all.' "'Aileen shuddered. "'Oh, how awful!' Ian tore a piece of his shirt sleeve and stopped the bleeding of his wound as well as he could, and they rode on in silence for a time, till they came to a place where the road divided for Haltswhistle and Brampton. The trees grew thickly by the stream, and it was getting dark. Let us hide here, Ian said. They are unlikely to see us, and we can then go whichever way they do not. They cannot be here for some time, so the horses can again get a feed and a rest. They piled up some dead leaves where two fallen trunks made a sort of shelter, did what they could for Ian's wound, and huddled together and waited. At last, after about two hours, they dimly saw three horses. There was only one rider, but the fugitives guessed that the others carried the dead and the injured man. Four men walked beside them. "'I can hardly move another step,' they heard one of them say. "'I do not suppose you're as tired as I am,' said a second voice. "'Besides, I bruised myself pretty badly when that devil brought my horse down. I shall be too stiff to move tomorrow.' Well, said a third voice, which both recognized as that of Father Martin, this kind of game is not in my line anyway. Ride, ride, it is nothing but ride. I shall be too sore to sit down for a week. When on earth are you going to bring me to a place for a night's rest? S death. I almost feel as though I did not care what happened to the villains. I'm so worn out. That's three of my men dead, for I reckon Philip there will never speak again. Fancy that little she-cat killing Gilbert." "'That's you, pussy,' softly whispered Ian in her ear. "'Well, this is the way to halt, Whistle. "'That's six miles nearer than Brampton,' said one of the other voices. "'And they are more likely to have gone there to put us off the track. "'Anyway, we can get men over to Brampton soon after daylight.' "'Thanks for the information,' again whispered Ian. "'Gradually the voices died away in the still evening air, "'and finally the sound of the horse's hoofs also. "'Thou art a naughty boy to whisper like that.' said Aileen. Mary, it was safe enough for a noise as they were making. They waited a little longer, and then Aileen put on her own clothes, which were now quite dry. She was also going to cut off her hair, but Ian dissuaded her, so she braided it very tightly and concealed it with the bonnet. They walked by their horses for an hour, and then mounted and reached Brampton at ten o'clock at night. They approached the small hostelry and dismounted. Can you give my page and myself supper and a night's lodging? Ian inquired. The horses will want a good rub down too. They are tired. Whence have you come and whither bound? said mine host. We've come from Alston today, and we're bound for Scotland tomorrow. But show us a seat and a fire. This is no time for talk. Come in then, but you should not be travelling to Scotland now. There's trouble on the border again, and you may fall in with more than you desired. But it's none of my business. At first the place looked empty, but there was a boy curled up on a settle and fast asleep. Ian looked at him, and to his surprise, it was Wilfred. He hesitated a moment before waking the lad. It seemed unkind. He looked so comfortable, but it might assist toward Aileen's safety. So he lightly touched him on the shoulder. Wilfred looked up and rubbed his eyes. When he saw who it was, a look of pleased surprise spread over his face. "'What are you doing here, Will?' said Ian. "'You said you wanted me to keep a lookout for you near Brampton, Master Menstrie. So Matthew and I—' finding there was work to be done at Nayworth Castle, have come over here. Matthew is lodging at a house near the castle, but as Master Forster here is a friend of Matthew's, I am staying with him. I was to go and help Matthew as soon as we had news of you, but I have spent all my time on the road for some days. He will be so glad to hear you have got back again. We heard in Carlisle that you had been drowned, but I knew you were a great swimmer and felt it could not be true and that you would go on to Holwick as you said. Did you get there? asked the boy. Yes, I got there all right. And what did you do about the little lady? The little lady is safe so far, said Ian. And Angus, one of the pages from the hall, is coming with me to see if we can make arrangements for her in Scotland. I'm glad to hear she's safe. The boy, Angus and I, are leaving early tomorrow for Longtown. If those rascals follow us up and you get a chance to delay them, do so. 
a loose shoe proved very useful before. William Forster, the innkeeper, brought supper, and Wilfred, who was now thoroughly awake, boy-like, was not averse to sharing their meal. "'There's a room prepared for you upstairs,' said Forster. "'I suppose your page will be all right on the other settle?' "'Yes, that will do,' answered Ian. "'You do not mind, little one?' he whispered softly after the man had gone. "'I think it is best.' "'Of course not,' she answered. After the meal, they sat by the fire for a few minutes, and Ian looked across at the two boys, as they seemed. Wilfred was immensely better in health, and had entirely lost the half-starved look. "'He's certainly a beautiful lad,' Ian mused. "'They make as fine a pair of boys as Aileen and Audrey were girls. I must paint those two, just like that, if ever we get safely through. I wish I could sketch them now.' When Ian had retired, Wilfred, who was fascinated by his companion, tried to draw her into conversation. But she was very reticent and pleaded that she wanted to go to sleep, which was indeed true. "'You have a fine master now,' said Wilfred, "'even though he's only a carpenter. He doesn't look like a man to have a page in those rough homespuns of his. But you are lucky, going round and serving him. I wish I had the chance. I would die for that man.' "'So would I,' said Aileen quietly. "'Then I'll love you too,' said the boy. "'But you are right. We must go to sleep.' In the morning Wilfred woke early, while it was still quite dark, and roused Angus, as Ian named Aileen. "'Go, you, and wake your master,' he said. Aileen found Ian, and after a meal they took lanthorns out to the stable and prepared to start. Wilfred helped them and chattered away to Aileen, trying in every way to lighten her share of the labours. While Ian was settling the score, Wilfred took Aileen aside. "'Remember, Angus,' he said, that we are both willing to die for him, and if ever I am wanted, I am ready. He risked his life for me, and I can never repay him. Risked his life for you? When? I never heard of it. Wilfred looked at her. Do you mean to say he never told you? No, he is not the kind that would. Oh, I should like to stay and hear all about it, but I must not wait. Master Menstrie will be wanting me. I wish I could tell you everything, but I am so glad that you love him. I'm sure that you and I would be great friends, very great friends. Oh, if only I could go with you, but we must say good-bye. And then Wilfred hesitated. I'm sure I do not know how it is, he said shyly. I sometimes used to kiss my best friend Hugh when there was no one else near, but boys don't kiss much. However, we two shall never meet again, and somehow I want to kiss you. He approached her a little awkwardly. There were tears in his eyes, and Aileen let him kiss her. "'Good-bye again, Angus. I shall not forget you,' he said. At that moment Ian returned, and they mounted their horses and bade farewell, and rode off. The boy stood in the grey dawn, gazing regretfully after them down the road. Then a thought struck him. He felt puzzled. "'Why, I do not believe that was a boy at all. No, I'm sure it was not. It must have been the little lady herself. What a fool I was not to think of it before. But fancy her taking a kiss from the likes of me.' They had hardly disappeared from sight when he heard the clatter of hoofs behind him and a body of armed men rode down the street. "'Good morrow, my lad,' said their leader. "'You are up betimes.' Wilfred had decided that it would be best to appear very communicative, and then perhaps they would not trouble to ask anyone else. "'Yes,' he said. "'There have been some silly loons here who did not know what a good thing bed is on a cold winter morning, rooting me up to look after their horses.' and Wilfred half turned on his heel as though he would go back to the house. "'Not so fast, my lad,' said the leader. "'Who were they, and what were they like?' "'Oh, there were two of them, a man in homespun and his page. Though why he should have a page perplexed me not a little. Do you know who he was, good sirs? I should like to know the meaning of it.' "'That is not your concern, lad. Come, can you tell me any more? Was he a big man?' "'No, he was about middle size but very well built, with deep-set grey eyes and a fine face. Hm, grunted the horseman. Deep-set grey eyes? Yes. To the devil with the fine face. And what about the other? he added. Oh, he was a pretty slip of a boy. Were they armed? They both had swords, and the man had pistols. That's they, right enough. But one more question. Where did they come from, and where are they going? They came from Alston, and arrived very tired last night. That settles it. And which way did you say they had gone now? Oh, they set off along the Carlisle Road, long before it was light. 
You don't want to find them, do you? You'll never do it if you stand talking here. Mary, you've got your work cut out for you if you want to catch them. Come along, men, said their leader. They must be pretty well in Carlisle by now, shouted Wilfred as they started off. You will hardly do it. To hellfire with them, but we'll get them yet. And the horses thundered down the road. End of chapter 24「Chapter Twenty Five of the Child of the Moat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter Twenty Five amazing discoveries wilfred stood and rubbed his hands i would give a week's pay to see them in carlisle he chuckled meanwhile ian and aline gently made their way along the road to longtown without mishap they saw a small body of troopers once but the troopers took no notice of them in the desultory border warfare people went about their business practically unconcerned life had to go on and if they waited till there was no fighting to all intents and purposes they might in those districts wait forever what are we going to do when we reach scotland aline asked when at the last it appeared that immediate danger was passing old moll does not seem to have been right this time she added we cannot say yet burdine there are many perils and difficulties ahead perhaps greater than we have yet passed i wish i could shake off the feeling of that woman it is not that i believe any of her prophecies of course they are all nonsense but she is the very incarnation of the spirit of evil a continual oppressive reminder of its presence in the world there is no doubt too that she has a snake-like inexplicable influence over people and puts evil suggestion into their minds just as some other people have exactly the opposite power to talk with moll rouses one's worst nature to talk with some rouses one's best he looked at aline and thought how wonderful her power was what was this power mysteriously possessed by some natures that almost by their very presence they could change men's lives aline and moll might themselves be the warring spirits of good and evil my only object for the moment he said aloud was to rescue you from your desperate danger i thought that then we might have time to think out something there are difficulties indeed the country is in a very unsettled condition partly the troubles with england partly the religious troubles and the difficulty with the regent mary of guise and france but our first trouble is that i have no money and people with no money always find it hard to live and he smiled a rueful smile neither have i said aline at least not to live on i have two gold pieces with me well you are richer than i am he said playfully it will help us somewhat while i find something to set us going i left a note too with wilfred for walter margrove in case he should come within the next few days asking him to send wilfred to canonby with a little money at once for our present needs wilfred said aline is that will ackroyd yes said ian i have a story to tell you about how i met him but we must leave it for the present i am very perplexed about this matter of making a livelihood he paused a moment and then continued i might find work as a carpenter or perhaps there will be more call for a smith in these turbulent times 
but i cannot think what to do with you even if i found some people with whom you could live and worked to keep you there would be all kinds of questions as to where you came from and all about you then why not let me work with you as carpenter's boy like will does for matthew musgrave what and spoil your beautiful hands by the way though he added what have you been doing to get them in such a shocking condition i have noticed it all along but my mind has been so full of schemes and plans for our escape that i have not been able to talk about it aline told him the story and continued anyway carpentry could not be as bad as that ian was shocked and looked at her thankfully i trust we have broken the evil spell he said but princess you are a lady and such very hard work is beyond that to which you have been used yes i hope i am a lady and just because i am a lady it does not matter what i am used to i can turn my hand to anything i do not mind it is only common people who are afraid of demeaning themselves i have often noticed and then she suddenly stopped was not ian himself one of these common people and was it not unmannerly anyway for a real lady to talk like that noticed what asked ian oh just notice that it is so and by way of changing the subject she went on but there is one thing i should mind i should mind having to cut my hair short ian sighed yes you must not do that little one we must think of some other plan but i have quite made up my mind and i am going to cut it she said in her most queenly manner she said it so firmly and cheerfully that even ian did not realize the struggle that was going on in the little heart well princess if it must be so it must but you need not cut it above the shoulders many pages wear it down to the shoulders pages yes but not carpenters boys at the same time ian's words gave her a gleam of comfort that was not quite so terrible it would have a good start as soon as she could let it grow again do you think a carpenter's boy could wear it down to his shoulders she asked wistfully certainly said ian it might be a little peculiar but if we could afford to dress you a little more like a page though you were a carpenter's boy i doubt even if any one would notice they had reached longtown by this time but ian decided not to stop if they could get safely over the border they rode on therefore until they met a small patrol near canonby but were allowed after a few explanations to pass at the little inn they made enquiry as to the news of the day this was surprising but to ian by no means altogether unexpected the protestant feeling had been growing and some of the protestant leaders had met at the house of james sim in edinburgh and signed the first covenant called the godly band they were the earl of Urgyle, glencarn the good earl moretown archibald lord of lorne and john erskine of dune footnote the spelling of the names is taken from a surviving copy of the covenant End of footnote. but what was of immediate interest and importance to ian was that the earl of haywick footnote this is a fictitious title and likewise the border incident although there were several such a phrase in this year End of footnote was at that moment raising forces in the border shires nominally to fight on the border but in reality to be ready to support the protestant cause against mary of guise his headquarters were but a few miles away and ian wondered whether it was not his duty to throw in his lot with them his own feelings on the whole were friendly to england and he hated the policy that the regent was pursuing of making scotland an appendage of france 
but if english marauders invaded the border he was quite ready as a true scot to fight against them although it was the religious cause that he had more deeply at heart methinks i ought to join them he said i have seen a good deal of fighting in my day and i might be useful to the cause i will go with you said aline nonsense child girls do not fight joan of arc fought and why should not i she replied joan of arc was older than you and could stand a strain that would be quite beyond you little one hardy as you are but i should go as your page or attendant would you fight as a trooper or on foot because that of course would make some difference that would remain to be seen but in any case it would be absurd for you to be there but it has given me a new idea sweet child they should be glad of my services and as they are protestants they would be only too pleased to look after you in return but i want to come with you he looked at her sadly it is out of the question he said oh but please let me no burdine you might be killed well that would not matter i have no friends or relatives in the world to care for me it might be the simplest solution of our difficulties if i died trying to help a good cause you must not talk like that aline i cannot bear to think of it but i have made up my mind i am coming you might be wounded and i might be just the one to help you and prevent your dying she drew herself up as she spoke and ian knew that further argument was useless in that case we can wait and rest here in any wise for to-day the which we both need i can then go and see the earl to-morrow and probably we can continue to rest for some days while he is recruiting his forces they retired early aline had a little room with a glorious outlook oh how beautiful everything was and how good god had been to her when she was half undressed she sat down and gazed out of the window so this was dear scotland again the land of her birth for the moment the recollection of mala the graves clouded the prospect but it passed away the sombre hills looked kindly in the gloaming she felt hardly able to contain herself for joy it was true that she was about to face new dangers but that did not trouble her in the least she would be definitely doing her duty as she conceived it fighting for a good cause along with many others she would no longer be a hunted fugitive merely trying to preserve her own life she knelt down and prayed and felt happier than she had done since her father died happier even than during the best days in the secret room so happy was she that she proceeded to cut off her wonderful hair just below the level of the shoulders without the slightest twinge of regret i wish i had audrey's long mirror here was the only thought that troubled her even this was unexpectedly gratified for in the morning she was down first and discovered a long mirror and a black oak frame one of the treasures of the hostel as she was looking at herself ian appeared the sight cost him a pang oh child he exclaimed what have you done i've only made myself into a real boy she answered ian bit his lips he would not have thought that he could have minded so much as they were standing there the door suddenly opened and a boy came in hello wilfred is that you yes master i have brought a letter from walter margrove ian took the letter and went over to the window seat on the far side of the room to read it wilfred thought aline wilfred it had a familiar sound before when ian used the name on the road and he came from kirkoswald there was too a tale to be told as ian had said and ian himself had been using an assumed name 
could it by any chance be the boy of little joan's sad story he held out his hand bashfully and bent his head as aline took it he said i humbly crave your pardon but i believe now i know who you are aline blushed and then she said quietly you have probably guessed rightly whom do you think i am he looked at her for a moment how could there possibly be any doubt there could not be two such beautiful people in the world and he had heard walter and andrew besides ian allude to her unparalleled loveliness you are mistress gillespie he said and bowed awkwardly aline smiled sadly yes she said i am and i believe i have just discovered who you are your name is not really Ackroyd, is it yes mistress it is he answered aline looked baffled but he continued however i have never been known as Ackroyd, as i lived with an aunt whose name was johnstone i thought so she replied softly come sit over here for i have a sorrowful tale for you she took his hand and the boy followed lost in wonder and admiration i used to know poor little joan she said very gently yes mistress i had guessed as much we heard in kirkoswald what had happened and the boy's eyes filled with tears i know that you did everything for her that could be done and that she loved you aline felt relieved as she was spared the worst part of her task she often used to speak of you wilfred and before she went away she gave me her greatest treasures which you had given her long before and i was to try and return them to you but alas i had to flee from armed men at a moment's notice in peril of my life and i have them not but they are safe and one day i will fulfil my charge she held out her hand oh i'm so sorry for you she said but my words are too feeble to say what i feel the tears were now running freely down the boy's face he took her hand in both his and smothered it with kisses oh joan joan my little joan how can i bear it how can you really be dead and i alive why is the world so cruel oh joan if only i could have died for you aline bent over and kissed him on the forehead she told me to give you that she said then after a pause she went on i'm only a little girl and i do not pretend to understand things wilfred but think if you had died as you have been wishing poor little joan would have been as unhappy as you are now these things are a mystery and yet somehow i feel that the spirit of light in its own way and in its own time must triumph over the spirit of darkness i have always felt that and now that i have my new faith i am more sure of it than ever i do not see how that can be said wilfred and yet as you speak i seem to feel better i do not understand it myself said aline but i have been right before wilfred looked at her had this wonderful child with the strange deep dark blue eyes some power that other mortals had not angus said ian's voice from the other side of the room walter has sent us some money he also offers to help us in every way he can and there are some other items that will interest you about the rumours he heard in carlisle they seem to think we rode through carlisle and went to penrith or keswick i have written a short note to walter which wilfred can take back did you come in the night will yes i got a lift on an empty wagon going back to longtown there was straw on the bottom and i slept all the way i am afraid i could not sleep in a wagon said ian come and join us at our meal wilfred they had their meal and afterwards sat and talked until it was time for wilfred to return 
after he had gone aline and ian set off to the camp where the earl of haywick lay when they arrived ian asked if he might see the earl as he wished to offer his services the sentry looked at him very dubiously and then at aline after which he seemed a little more satisfied as she was better dressed finally he called the officers of the guard who subjected them to a similar scrutiny i think i can see to your business my man he said thank you i have a special message for my lord of haywick said ian aline started at the tone and looked at ian there was a quiet hauteur about it that she had never heard before the man seemed to notice it too who is it that wishes to see the earl he said say ian menstry son of alexander menstry that will do aline felt a little nervous as she had never met a real earl and had something of the child's imagination about the grandeur of such personages the officer returned very quickly but the change in his manner seemed almost to make him a different man your grace he said bowing very low the earl of haywick is coming at once i said ian menstry not alexander menstry answered ian looking a little annoyed yes your grace said the messenger i made it quite clear the earl of haywick understands aline was very puzzled they seemed to have strange customs of address in the army but before she had time to think the earl appeared she was a little disappointed was that an earl he was a fair figure of a man but was neither as handsome as ian nor had he she suddenly thought as she looked at the two men the dignity of ian's carriage i am so glad to see you again your grace he said doffing his bonnet and bowing as the officer had done you are the very man we want i shall never forget how well you managed on that miserable day at pinky clue and scotland can never repay you for the rout of lord wharton on the western marches on that cold february day it was a sorry remnant that he and gray took back with them and it marked the turning of the tide our country was indeed at a low ebb then of course you will share the command with me i would willingly serve under you but these are my fellows and they know me so i shall just follow your advice on my honour you shall have all the glory when it is over not that you used to care much for that kind of thing and you were really only a lad then aline's eyes grew rounder and rounder haywick continued i heard the news of the old man's death about a week ago it was somewhat of a shock following so soon after your brother's but i said that will bring ian menstry back to us if anything will i am sure he will throw in his lot with us aline gasped who was ian then this carpenter man as she had thought him even in the earlier days she had never supposed that he could be more than a younger son of one of the lesser lairds ian seemed overcome and very sad well my lord if you must know he said in as calm a voice as he could muster i am here by accident i have just had a run for my life with my young page here angus gillespie i am looking rather a sorry object but let that pass i had not heard of my father's death or even of my brother's it is a terrible shock poor fellow said haywick i am sorry to be the bearer of bad news and you are looking a sad wreck you may take as many days rest as we can manage before i forget i want to know if you can let us have a couple of horses these are not mine and i want to return them to the owner i also wish to know if you can spare a couple of troopers to take them back to kirkoswald they can arrange the matter at carlisle are they english horses yes ha 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 fancy returning english horses across the border when once you have got them here well you always were a strange fellow yes you can have as many troopers as you please and horses and anything you want 
aline was very impatient to have ian by himself and was glad when he turned to go after giving a brief account of his imprisonment and the outline of his main adventures avoiding all details the earl accompanied them to the inn and then took his leave promising to send ian an outfit such as more became his station and at ian's special request everything that under the circumstances could be procured befitting a page of gentle birth aline was pleased to find no one in the hostel ian was tired and his wounds hurt him although aline had attended to them regularly he sat down by the fire and sighed it was a cold day and aline crouched at the hearthstone by his feet she put her hand on his knee and looked up ian's eyes were full of tears aline had never seen anything like this she stood up stroking his head with her delicate hand and kissed him on the forehead he did not speak but drew her gently to him the child threw both her arms about his neck and seated herself on his knee oh i wish i could comfort you she said it was too much for ian and two great tears actually rolled down his cheek my father was all that he said then making an effort he controlled himself and looked at aline's beautiful sympathetic little face a curious feeling passed through him he had lost his father and his father had never been kind to him and he had gained this child who was devoted to him was this god's recompense he passed his fingers through her short locks what have you done with all the glory you cut off he said it's upstairs i plated it in four plates may i have some he asked you may have it all if you like it was a big sacrifice child heart he said softly and kissed her may i ask you something she said even though it does make you sad but i would rather learn from your own lips you know you have not told me who you are who are you he paused a moment while he continued gently stroking her hair i am now the duke of ochil little one aline rose from his knee and crouched down on the hearth again she gazed up at him wonderingly in after years as she looked back she understood her feelings but at the time they were a perplexity even to herself so far from being pleased that he was a duke she resented it it seemed to put a barrier between them his grace the duke of ochil could not be the same as her dear friend ian ian saw the expression on her face and half guessed its meaning it does not please you heart cease he said she looked up quickly and then said simply i do not know it is strange End of chapter 25「twenty six of the Child of the Moat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter twenty six The Battle of Liddesdale. The days slipped by, and when Haywick had mustered two thousand foot and some three hundred horse, he decided to move northward up Liddesdale. The Duke of Ochil nominally commanded the cavalry, but was really the guiding spirit of the whole. Angus, that is, Aileen, acted as Ochil's page or squire, and was soon very highly in favor with all the officers. She was, however, very uncommunicative, and kept herself to herself, the which she found much easier in that there was a reserved hauteur about Ian when dealing with those that were at all his equals, which he never displayed when dealing with inferiors. At the same time, everyone's respect for him was very marked, and his power over the men was immense. This new aspect of his character interested Aileen not a little. There had been rumors for some time of a gathering for an English raid upon Scotland, and early on the morning of the third day after leaving Cannonby, 
Their scouts brought word of the presence of an English force, three thousand strong, that had moved up the Tyne from Bellingham. Before setting forth, the Duke of Ockel spoke a few words of encouragement to the men. It may seem, he said, that neither on their side nor on ours are there enough to make our encounter of great moment. Yet is there more in the balance than that of which ye may be in any wise aware. Our country is in the hour of her trial, and a little thing may decide the final outcome. On the one hand there is France, and on the other hand there is England, both eager to swallow her up. Yet are there greater issues than this. Not only is the freedom of our bodies at stake, but the freedom of our souls, and not only of our souls, but of those of mankind. Our host is small, and our deeds may be obscure, yet though fame is not likely to be ours, that which we do this day may well be the foundation of greater things, and by our blood we may purchase liberty of conscience throughout the whole world. No deed is ever so small as to be of no account, and if we play the coward it may be the small beginning that shall bring upon the nations an avalanche of woe. It is for the higher that we strive, for all that is noblest in man against all that is low. Yea, I know that many of you here, yourselves, forget the glory of our destiny, zealous though ye be within your lights. Yet it is the field of enlightenment against darkness. It is truth and development, love and beauty against all that is narrow and stagnant, false and ugly. And if victory be with us, see how great is the charge upon us that we ourselves do not fall short of our high endeavor." I have said that our host is small and our deeds must be small likewise, and yet it is not a little thing that I ask of each individual man. I ask all that ye have. I ask your lives. Nor do I presume to say that the Lord is on our side, but I do say that if each do act according to his conscience, while putting aside all prejudice and all bitterness of heart that might narrow that conscience, it is not for us to fear the issue. Yea, as far as our minds may discern, we fight for God and our country." So he spoke, and there went up a great shouting, For God and for our country! It was a still, cold day, and the very air seemed tense with the issues involved. Aileen's heart beat with excitement, yet she was surprised how calm she felt. Surely I am afeard, she said, and yet I am full of gladness, and am ready to give my life, as Ian has asked. She rode upon a grey charger, carrying the banner of Ockel, which she had hastily made at Cannonby with her own hands. Azure, a fess between three crescents argent. Footnote. A blue field, divided horizontally by a broad silver band. Two silver crescents above, and one below. End of footnote. Ian lacked Aileen's happy disposition, and looked troubled, but his resolution to do or die was no whit less determined. The English cavalry were, as usual, immensely superior in numbers, and while the Scots forces were forming their line, they hoped to press the advantage by a charge which at the same time should cover the advance of their own infantry deploying out of the valley. The Scots were in two ranks, with the reserves below the crest of the hill, every front man, the butt of his pike against his right foot and the point breast high, the while those behind crossed their pike points with those forward. Ian held his horsemen back on the right flank, while the bowmen were on the left. The enemy charged swiftly over the hawk, their gay pennons aflutter on their lances, a brave sight to see, and as they came they shouted, down with the heretics! Come on, ye coward loons! For God and our country! the Scots replied, as the wave of Southrons hurled itself upon the bristling pikes, only to break and scatter, as many a man of that goodly host met his doom. Ian, taking them at a disadvantage, led the Scots' horse in a counter-charge, and menacingly they thundered over the plain, so that despite his smaller force he drove them behind their own lines, and numbers more of the English bit the dust, and among them the Lord of Almeth their leader, a noble and brave youth, who received a lance thrust in his side, and fell to earth gripping the soil with both his hands in the agony of death. And many a gay Scots gallant lay on the ground between the hosts and the corbies gathered in the air watching for their time to come. Then for a while the battle fell to those on foot, and furiously they fought, and many doughty deeds were done on either side that day. But terrible was the slaughter, as neither party would yield the advantage to the other and the shouting of the fighters mingled with cries of the wounded, and ever and anon there boomed the roar of the artillery in which the English had the better of the Scots. The fight was stubborn, and Aileen's mood, at first all eager, now gave place to one of dread. The light began to fail, and a voice within the air seemed to whisper, "'Whensoever the day goes down, the spirits of darkness will gather for your destruction, and then it will be too late.' She even thought she saw old Maul stalking through the battlefield, and gloating over the slain. 
The battle wavered from side to side, and at length it seemed for the Scots as though all were lost. They had sadly given way, and at the direst moment of their need, the Earl of Sankar, a man of great valour and a tower of strength, was shot by an English archer, and the arrow went in at his throat and pierced right through his neck, and he fell forward speechless, and the dark mist clouded his eyes. Then the Scots wavered and fell back still more, and the end seemed come, and had it not been for the Earl of Haywick himself, they would have been utterly worsted. He rushed into the fray, and heartened the wavering host, and they made a great onset, and the battle stayed not. Yet did the cannon of the English work sore havoc in the Scottish ranks, whensoever they were not in close combat. And the Duke of Ochil came to the Earl, and said, My Lord of Haywick, I will endeavour to capture them, and we may even turn them on our foes. He spoke, and Aileen followed hard after, and he led his men behind the hill to the other flank, and then made as he would charge the footmen on the English right. But as he came near to them he swerved, and passing round he advanced to the mouths of the guns, and left and right his men fell on either hand and their souls fled from them. But Aileen rode safely at his side. And they came right over against the gunners, and one of them did shout lustily and swing his rod over the duke, and would have felled him to the earth, had not Aileen driven the point of her long sword through his mouth even as he shouted, and he fell backward and was trampled under foot, while the rod fell harmlessly upon the saddle-bow, and the rest turned to flee but were cut down, and not a man of them escaped. "'Thou art indeed the good angel of my destiny,' said Ian, but he spake not more at that time, as the fight was heavy upon him. Then were the English guns turned upon the English host, and fear got hold of them, brave men though they were, for that they were taken behind and before, and as they shook and hesitated the duke with the two hundred that were left to him charged toward them from the rear, and Aileen went ever at his side. But the English horse made haste to come at him from far on their own right, and take him in flank, or ever he closed with those on foot. And as the English foot turned, some this way toward the Scottish horse, and some that way toward the Scottish foot, a mighty shout arose in the Scottish ranks as they closed with the English. Now are they delivered into our hands! And they waxed ever more terrible till confusion fell upon the men of England, and the half of them broke and fled, and thus hindered the more part of their own horsemen from coming at the duke. So he fell upon the other half, and victory came on a sudden into his hands, for all the English were now in flight, and the left wing of their horse that would have taken the duke in flank fled also. And as he thanked God for his triumph he looked back, and his heart failed him, and he shuddered and his breath stood still, for Aileen was no longer to be seen, in that the grey horse had gone down at the last. As he gazed, his head swam, and darkness came over him. Victory was his, but Aileen was lost. He calmed himself and held his spirit in check, and even as the wind races over the hills his thoughts pass through him. The enemy is scattering on every side. My work for my country is done, and therefore may I now turn to that which concerneth my own life. There was not a moment to be let slip. The remnant of the right wing of the foeman's horse was still unbroken, and although too late now to effect their purpose, yet, if so be that Aileen were still alive, they would pass over the very ground where she must be lying, or ever a man might run thither, however swiftly he sped. He swung round and galloped apace, and there, dead upon the earth, was the grey horse, and by it, on the side next the foe, lay stretched the fair, slim page, still clutching the banner with a silver fess. "'Surely it will be my own death,' he said, as the horseman bore down upon him. For an instant the thought unnerved him, but nevertheless he was at her side. "'What matter?' he cried. "'The day is won, my work is done, and Aileen dead, of what avail is life to me?' He leaped from his horse. It was too late. Even now they were upon him. He might not lift her to the saddle and bear her away. "'Can I not break the tide with a barrier of slain steeds?' he said. Then swift as the lightning flashes in the heavens, with his right arm he swung her over her own dead horse, while with his left he raised a fallen pike. He leaped back and kneeled before the horse, gripping the pike full firmly whose butt rested on the ground, while with his right hand he drew forth a pistol from his holster. On they came— they towered into the sky. The air was filled with their shouting and the thunder of their hoofs. A single man. They heeded him not. He fired, and the horse that would have trampled him fell low. Neck and croup over, it rolled upon the ground, and the horse behind that strove to leap above it received the pike in its heart, while Ian narrowly avoided destruction under the falling mass. Then, as a stream meets a boulder in its course and straightway divides on either hand, so passed the warriors on the left and right. The rider of the first fallen horse lay in the throes of death, 
but the second rushed upon him with his sword so that the duke had but scant time to draw and defend himself, and the sword cleft the duke's helm, and the wound was deep. Yet it was no long time they fought, for with swift skill the duke drove his sword throughout his body, and he fell with a loud cry to the ground, stretching his arms to heaven, and Ian drew out the steel, and with the blood the life rushed forth, and black night covered his eyes. But Ian, even as he did so, turned to where Aileen lay, her face all white amid the ruddy gold. He leaned above her. She was not dead, nor even sorely hurt, but stunned and dazed and cut about and bruised. He raised her with great tenderness and bore her from the scene of carnage just as the evening fell. A cold breath blew upon his face, and he fancied he heard a voice that hissed, "'Woe is me! We are foiled. It is on us the blow has fallen, even ere the darkness came. Too late! Too late!' At that moment the sun sank, and the light vanished behind the hills. The rout was now complete. Here and there a few individuals made stand against their pursuers, while little groups of wounded men were crying for succor. The hawk was littered with so many corpses of those who had gone forth that morning in the healthful beauty of their youth, that it was a sight most grievous to behold. Ian stumbled with his burden. He himself had been twice sadly wounded again. Whither should he go? There were no houses in sight. He remembered, however, that the house of the Laird of Dalwinnie was only about two miles away. There was nowhere else to go, but both the new wounds and the old were exceeding sore, and it was with great difficulty that he carried her. He bore her to the foot of the hill, and summoned four troopers, and with their assistance mounted a horse. He would not let anyone else touch the child, and accompanied by the troopers he rode to the house. The Laird was not a Protestant, but Ian was graciously received, an offer was made to accommodate as many of the wounded as possible. "'You had leave her pay special attention to those poor English varlets,' said Ian. "'There will be few to give them heed.' The lady smiled a sad smile, and led the way to a beautifully appointed room. "'Your grace has a wondrous fair child with you,' she said. "'I marvel not at your care for him. Is he sore hurt?' "'I trust not,' said Ian, as he laid Aileen gently down. He dared not let anyone help him, lest Aileen's secret should be discovered. So he dressed her wounds himself and put her to bed. End of chapter 26